Hello, and welcome to Budget Commander. On this channel, we'll discuss Magic the Gathering topics with a focus on playing Commander on a budget. We'll cover things like deck building, top cards, deck techs, and more. Let's get started. Hello friends, today we have an AR First of Lock Thwain deck tech for you. This is a budget deck tech, specifically 1DH, meaning all the cards in the deck are $1 or under, with the exception of the commander who can be up to $5. Price of this deck was just under $41 as of the day of recording. Prices were checked using mtgstocks.com. Please note that the prices do fluctuate, so where I have them listed in this video, they may be above or below that depending on when you are seeing this. This is an aristocrat style deck, so the goal of this deck is to get extra advantage off of our own creatures dying. Ara makes for a great aristocrat's commander because she says whenever she or another black creature enters the battlefield under our control, each opponent is going to lose one life and we are going to gain one life. She also has the secondary ability that says tap, sacrifice another black creature and we get to draw a card. So we're going to try and get a bunch of creatures out, token creatures, extra ways to make those creatures, and then we're going to sacrifice them to draw a bunch of cards and hopefully whittle our opponents down by forcing them to lose life, keeping ourselves in the game by gaining life. As always, we're going to talk about the accelerants in the deck. These are the cards that get us access to extra mana, help us to get into our game plan early. Then we'll talk about the cards specific to our game plan, how we're going to get those value engines going. We'll talk about cards that interfere with our opponent's game plan, what they're trying to do. Next, we'll talk about the cards that provide consistency to our deck, help us get our engines going and keep them going. And then lastly, we'll talk about the lands that allow us to play the spells in our deck. So for Accelerants, we have these three Mana Rocks, Mindstone, Heraldic Banner, and Mana Geode. When the Geode enters, it allows us to scry one. We can tap it for a black. Heraldic Banner enters and we're going to choose black, making it so all of our black creatures get plus one plus zero. And we can tap it for black. And then Mindstone taps for a colorless, but we can also pay one and sacrifice it later on down the road when we don't need it for mana to draw a card. Manalith allows us to tap for a black. And then the Unstable Obelisk taps for a colorless, but also later on in the game, we can pay seven, tap it, tap the obelisk, sacrifice it to destroy any permanent. This is our only way to deal with enchantments or artifacts. So be selective about when you decide to use the obelisk to destroy something. We also have the Traveler's Amulet, not a true accelerant because it's not going to give us access to mana early. However, it does help us fix our land drops. It's incremental in that we can pay one to put it out and then when we have an extra one lying around, or when we get to a turn that we're not hitting that land drop and we really need to, we can pay one to sacrifice the amulet and fetch a basic swamp from our library to our hand. We have a couple rituals in Dark Ritual and Songs of the Damned, which can give us a big tempo swing, allow us to get a big play in one single turn. The Dark Ritual gives us access to two extra mana, and then Songs of the Damned gives us a variable amount equal to the number of creature cards in our graveyard. So early on in the game, this isn't going to really do much for us, but once we're into the mid and late game, we're going to be able to get a ton of mana off of this ritual spell. Alright, into our game plan. We want to play lots of creatures, put those creatures out, so a lot of them have a lower CMC. They create as tokens, or they're able to come back from the graveyard, like these three friends. Tenacious Dead, Reassembling Skeleton, and Cauldron Familiar. Tenacious Dead, we do have to leave two mana up to essentially regenerate it. So if it dies early on, we may want to use a Recur spell to get this back to our hand or reanimate it back to the battlefield. Reassembling Skeleton is an all-star because we can just let it sit in our graveyard whenever we have a couple extra mana, spend that to put it back onto the battlefield. Cauldron Familiar is doubly good because it drains our opponents out, which is what we're trying to do. But we have a couple ways to get food and we can sacrifice those food tokens to return the cauldrons familiar from our graveyard to the battlefield. We also have cards that give us tokens, the Doom Dissenter and Orzhov Enforcer when they die give us a token creature. The Orzhov Enforcer notably has Death Touch so it sits out as a deterrent making people not really want to swing in with their bigs at us. Piper of the Swarm taps every turn to give us a rat, those rats have menace, 
and if we ever have three rats we can tap and pay four with the Piper of the Swarm to steal a creature from our opponents. Pretty nice, we're not probably going to be getting too many steal effects because that's once every four turns, but if you got nothing else going on keep making rat tokens and then maybe you'll be able to gain control of your opponent's big Eldrazi or something clever. Putru Goblin comes back after its first, de first death with a minus one minus one counter because it has persist. Sultai Emissary enters and they're they're gonna manifest the top card of our library, giving us uh, an extra 2-2 creature. Maybe we even turn it into a creature later, but otherwise we just have another sack outlet. We also have Dreadhorde Invasion, which gives us a 1-1 zombie every single turn, as long as we are able to sacrifice that zombie, hopefully getting extra value off of this Dreadhorde Invasion. Desecrated Tomb gives us a 1-1 bat flying token anytime a creature leaves our graveyard. Sifter of Skulls gives us a 1-1 Eldrazi Scion that we can sack for extra mana anytime one of our non-token creatures dies. And then Singir Autocrat gives us 3-0-1 Black Surfs when it enters. Those Surfs do leave the battlefield or are exiled if the Autocrat is, is dead, but we're going to be usually sacrificing those Surfs or using them as chump blockers, and then we'll use the Autocrat last so that we get the most value unless our opponent targets it with a spell, which seems not likely. We also have Rite of Bells and Lock, which gives us two zero one one Clerics on the first and second chapter, and then a huge big 6-6 six, six Flying Trampler on the third chapter. It does force us to sack a creature each turn, but we got so many ways to get creatures back from our graveyard and make tokens. Uh, we don't mind that, and we love swinging in with big things. Noose Graph Mob comes in as a 5-5, five, five and then each time an opponent or ourself plays a spell, we remove a counter, so it turns into a 4-4, and then a 3-3, and whenever we move that plus one plus one counter, we get a 2-2 zombie, so it basically gives us a bunch of bodies to sacrifice. Abhorrent Overlord also gives us a bunch of bodies equal to our devotion to black. We get a 1-1 flying harpy, and this also comes in as a 6-6 flyer. God Pharaoh's Gift helps us turn our creatures in our graveyard into more bodies, giving us 4-4 zombies. We also get their ETBs or whatever other abilities those creatures have. And then Revenge of Ravens helps protect us a little bit in that our opponents aren't going to want to attack us because whenever they attack us with a creature, that creature's controller is going to lose a life and we are going to gain a life. So it helps uh, negate the attacking players, those combat players a little bit and gives us more time to set up our game plan. Kaya's Ghost Swarm helps us keep our game plan on the battlefield, uh, protects a creature, so Aara or any one of our other important creatures. If they would die or be exiled, we get to return them to the battlefield under our control. We are going to lose the Aura, but for only one mana, pretty good deal. Plague Belcher, Vindictive Vampire, and Falconrath Noble help us to drain or make our opponents lose life whenever our creatures die. The Belcher is specific to zombies, so you have a little bit of extra work there to get the Belcher to trigger, but he'll make each opponent lose a life. Vindicum Vampire is going to make each opponent lose a life, and we're going to gain a life whenever our creatures die. And then Falcon Wrath Noble, we get a point at a specific player and make them lose one life, and we gain one life. <sighs> Grey Merchant of Asphodel enters and drains our opponents for X equal to our devotion to to black giant skewer helps us get extra food tokens can protect us if we are on the defensive or help us if we're on the offensive just gives us more time with those food tokens also allows us to bring that cauldron familiar back as does the witch's oven gives us another sacrifice outlet turning our creatures into food which just gives us more life lastly into our game plan once we get into the late game we got kind of our engines going. We can turn our dead draws into 5-5 five, five demons using the blood-soaked altar. Pumping out a 5-5 five, five flyer each turn. If your opponents can't deal with that, they're going to be out of the game quickly. All right, to interfere with our opponent's game plan, we've got a lot of creature removal. Font of Agonies allows us to destroy a target creature as long as we remove four blood counters. This enchantment gets a blood counter every time we pay life. So you don't have to be hasty to get this out, but once you have one of your couple ways of getting paying life, this uh, helps us really control the board along with Tragic Slip, which allows us to give a creature minus 13, minus 13, as long as a creature died this turn, 
not hard to do in an aristocrat's deck. And Perilous Mirror, anytime it dies, we get to deal two damage to target creature or player. So it helps us get rid of a utility, you know, two or less toughness creature. Merciless Executioner, Fleshbag Marauder, and Plague Crafter all enter and force our opponents to sacrifice a creature. The Plague Crafter gets a creature or an, an, a Planeswalker, and if they don't have either of those, then they're going to be discarding a card. It also has a little bit bigger body as it's a 3-2 instead of a 3-1. We also have Force of Despair, which we can pay 3 to destroy all creatures that enter the battlefield this turn. And it has the versatility that if it's not our turn, we can exile a black card from our hand to basically play this card for free. So if somebody plays a spell to get a bunch of creatures onto the battlefield in one go, Force of Despair is really going to set them back. Obnixilis Reignited has several abilities, but we're mostly focused on that minus three because it allows us to destroy target creature, and then you're usually just going to be ticking it up, drawing a card, losing a life, until you want to destroy another target creature. Shriek Maw is a great fit in this deck because it has Evoke, so it's going to enter, and then you can sacrifice it, or it gets sacrificed, and you still get a destroyed creature, and you get all of your creatures, enters, and dies, triggers, or if you want, you can just pay 5 to have a 3-2 with fear and destroy a creature. Elders Reborn has three great chapters that force our opponents to sack creatures or planeswalkers, then discard cards, and then we get to bring something back from any graveyard to the battlefield under our control. Butcher of Malakir helps us to control the board because anytime one of our creatures dies, our opponents have to sacrifice creatures, including the Butcher himself. So with all of our sack outlets, this can really hurt our opponents. And then if things get really out of hand, we have Massacre Girl. And she, as long as you play her right, basically wipes the board of every creature except for her. You do have to, it's a little bit situational because whenever she enters, all the creatures get minus one, minus one. And then for each creature that dies from that minus one, minus one, all the creatures get an additional minus one, minus one. So there's a little bit of math to do, but you're usually going to be able to wipe the board with her. Last card for interference is Nihil Spell Bomb, and it just helps us to remove another player's graveyard. And whenever we have an extra one mana, we might just even crack it to help us draw a card. Other cards that draw us more cards are the Dusk Legion Zealot, which enters and loses us a life and draws a card. Alter's Reap and Costly Plunder allow us to sacrifice a creature to draw two cards. Or the Plunder, we actually have the choice of doing a creature or an artifact. Siphon Mind forces each of our opponents to discard a card, and then we draw a card for each card discarded this way. Sign in Blood allows us to trade two life for two cards, and then Grim Harvest turns all of our non-token creatures' deaths into a card draw for us as well. Underworld Connections allows us to pay a life to draw a card, so it gives us an extra draw every turn. Blood for Bones allows us to return one creature to the battlefield, and one card creature from our graveyard to our hand. We do have to sacrifice a creature for it, but a lot, a lot of value to be had out of Blood for Bones. Forever Young also allows us to recur at least one creature because we're putting creatures from our graveyard on top of our library and then drawing a card. We can put more than one creature on top of our library if we really want to. Gaunty Lord of Luxury enters and it's a 2-3 with Death Touch that when it enters essentially gives us a card draw because we're going to pick an opponent exile or look at the top four cards of their library exile our favorite one and then at any time we can cast that spell that we exiled regardless of the uh, colors color identity of that card obnixilis the hate twisted i put under consistency even though his minus two says destroy target creature that seems like an interference spell but the second clause of that says its controller draws two cards so we're actually probably going to target our own creatures with Obnixilis unless this allows us to take a player out because it's he has a secondary static ability that says whenever an opponent draws a card, Obnixilis the Hate Twisted deals one damage to that player. So if somebody's really low, we could actually use an Obnixilis to kill them because we're forcing them to draw cards which deals damage to them. Usually, however, we're going to use Obnixilis the Hate Twisted on ourselves. And then Aara, first of Locked Wayne, could have gone under game plan because she's going to be draining our opponents out anytime black creatures enter the battlefield. But I put her under consistency because and we can just sacrifice creatures to draw cards. And that's what aristocrat style decks want to do. So we put her under consistency. 
Last card for consistency is Gate to the Afterlife. This one essentially allows us to tutor up God Pharaoh's gift from our graveyard hand or library to the battlefield uh, for a total cost of five, three to put it out, two to sacrifice it, instead of paying seven for God Pharaoh's gift. That's the artifact that allows us to take creatures from our graveyard, exile them, and turn them into four fours. The first ability on here says that whenever a non-token creature we control dies, we gain one life. So that's nice. And then anytime we, or then we can draw a card, and if we do, we get to discard a card. So this helps us just to cycle through our deck, get the cards we want, and also put cards that fit in our graveyard, go in our graveyard well as well. Do note that you can't use the second ability of the Gate to the Afterlife unless you have six or more creatures in your graveyard. Okay, into the lands. These are the one cards that are going to help us cast our spells. We have Memorial to Folly, Mortuary Mire, and Witch's Cottage, which all can tap for black, but they also help us to get cards back from our graveyard. Mortuary Mire and Witch's Cottage put those uh, creatures from our graveyard on top of our library, and then Memorial to Folly allows us to sack it and put a creature from our graveyard into our hand. Barren Moor, Polluted Mire, and Desert of the Glorified all can be cycled, so we can discard them to draw new cards. They're great for later in the game when you draw and you're like, oh, land, no big deal, I can cycle it. We also have Ghost Quarter, which allows us to deal with any problematic lands our opponents are playing. And then 34 basic swamps. Aara is three black pips, so we didn't want to have too many different cards that tap for a colorless that were utility cards. We do like to get her out early if we can help it. We like that she costs only three because it's easy to bring her back for five and then for seven. As you can see, the average CMC of this deck was 3.05, so on the lower end, you can see quite a few one, two, and three drops, so you're usually going to be playing a lot of stuff, and then you got to kind of work your way around all your mana. Uh, it's a lot of fun to do the kind of mind magic of figuring out the best way to utilize your turn. If you like an aristocrat style deck, give this a go. This was the budget build, however, if you're looking to upgrade, these are the cards I would look at first. Grave Pact, Kalidus, Traitor of Get, Liliana, Dreadhorde General, all fit in great in this deck. Check out the link in the description below uh, for a tapped out deck that has a bunch of different possible upgrades you might want to consider if you're starting out budget and then slowly building this up to a non-budget deck. Share down in the comments below what upgrades you would put in this deck so other players can see and kind of build an AR deck to maximize it, make it a better deck or more fun deck as they go. Hope you enjoyed this video and have a great rest of your day. Peace. Thanks for watching. If you liked the video, you should like the video. You can subscribe by hitting the icon in the top left. YouTube thinks you'll like the video in the top right. Otherwise, you can check out one of the playlists on the bottom. Have a great day.